All right, men, we're dealing with the exaltation of Christ, as we've read this week in Boston's A Complete Body of Divinity. And now, instead of me preaching through this text of Scripture, what I want to do is an exercise that I think will be helpful for all of us. This is a kind of rapid-fire exercise at, for you really to think through, how do I prepare to teach family worship when I've got 20 or 30 minutes to study a text and be able to then think through, how am I going to teach this text to my family and think through, how do I look at just a few verses and pick out what is being taught? Or even, even if you can't write an outline or anything like that, I'm not saying that you need to do that for family worship, but how do you see kind of where the breaks are in the text so that you don't just read, read verses and then just kind of ambiguously talk about it, but you even kind of break it down and say, do you see where he says this? And then you can just explain, what does he mean by that? And then keep going, what does he mean by that? And then uh, we're going to work through together, we're going to work through application to just, I've got five things. I'm saying, how do we use the truths we learn here for these different things so that we can all start developing the instincts of application? So application is, it becomes instinctual. You, you see a truth and then you start going, how can I use that truth to warn, instruct, comfort, uh, examine, uh, direct, and all those different ways. So what we're going to do first is I'm going to walk through this text work with you, which you do not have to do before family worship. But because the exercise I'm going to give you that you're going to do on your own in writing divisions and writing a quick outline of this text, I want you to have a good understanding of what the words in the text mean. And then for about 20 minutes, I'm going to say, okay, now you look at this text in your own Bible or, or right there, even in the text work that I've printed off for you. And then you show me how would you divide this text up into all the different things that we learn in this text and then you write out a proposition above it of like, this is the truth that we should glean from this. This is the truth that is taught here. You're going to turn it into a short sentence of truth, not a heading or anything like that, but a, a statement of truth that stands on its own. That is a good way to say that is the truth that's being taught here, what we should glean from it. Does everybody understand where we're going for, what we're going for? Okay, so you've got that printout here. I've also got it on the screen just so I can put my mouse over it. But let's start off with this. We're, we're in the context of Philippians 2, which I would just remind you, the context is dealing, first of all, with Paul exhorting the church at Philippi to consider other people as more significant than themselves. And then he goes off into this, it's kind of like an excursus, from the main thing he's saying, and he's saying, have this mind among yourselves in verse 5, which is yours in Christ Jesus. And then verse 6 through 11, he launches into Christ humbled himself to consider even sinners more significant than himself in his humiliation to save us. And then he gets to the, and after that, God has highly exalted him, which also shows us what Paul is doing is saying, you want to be exalted? humble yourself to the dirt. And at the proper time, God will exalt you. You will be exalted in glory. But first comes humiliation. So now we come in verse 9 to this exaltation part. And let me just point out these things to you and make sure we're all clear on what is actually being said here. So verse 9 starts with, therefore. Therefore, what does that mean? What kind of clue is that? Talking about all of the said before this. Yeah. He said these things. Somebody give me one sentence of what he's talking about before verse 9. Just one sentence. It doesn't have, I don't mean read a verse. I mean, like, what is he talking about? What did Christ do? What is he putting forward? Humbled himself to the point of death. Right. So Christ humbled himself to the point of death. Therefore, God has highly exalted him. 
So because Christ humbled himself to the lowest of lows, then God, the, this is this God, Theos here, that's God the Father. How do we know that? How do we know that's not God the Holy Spirit or that that's not Christ? How do we know that's the Father? Because he was the one doing the exalting. Yeah. And even the context right there, therefore God has highly exalted him. Who's the him? It has to be Christ. It's, it has to be Christ because it's talking about he humbled himself. Now he's been exalted by the Father. The Father exalts him. You, you go further into the end of verse 11 and you see to the glory of God the Father. So this is, therefore, the Father has highly exalted him, him being Christ, the Son. That, that word has highly exalted. It's huper, it's huper rupsao, which the only reason you need to know that and the reason I point that out is it's two words and the first word is hyper, which is where even we get our word hyper. So what he's saying and the reason it's translated has highly exalted because it's a word saying he has super exalted the Lord Jesus Christ. He's not just exalted him. He has, this is a word that is only used one time in the New Testament. And it's talking about being super exalted. To exalt, it's a word that means to the highest possible rank and authority and power. So it's a very strong word. Because Christ humbled himself to the point of death, the Father has super exalted him, hyper exalted him. And not only that, and bestowed on him. Again, to him there is the Son. God the Father has not only hyper-exalted him, he has bestowed on him. This, this word bestowed, it's, it's to give graciously, to give freely, not under compulsion, not reluctantly, but to give freely. And it has to do with a pleasurable giving. And so the Father doesn't bestow the name that is above every name on the Son reluctantly in any way, but the Father being pleased with the redemption of Christ is pleased to bestow on Him the name that is above every name. Now, what I think Paul is actually getting at there is not some kind of mysterious name, and it's not just not only his reputation, which is what the name has to do with. A, a name is who you are and your worth, your reputation. But I think what he's actually getting at is the Father in raising Christ from the dead and exalting him has named him Lord. This is the same exact thing that Peter says on the day of Pentecost when he's preaching to the Jews. After the resurrection, Peter says, Therefore, be certain of this, men of Israel. God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Not meaning that the Father makes him Lord in some sense that he wasn't already, but the Father, in raising Christ from the dead, bestows on him this name, this title, highly exalting him and giving him the highest title imaginable. Lord of everything. And so that's the, he's bestowed on him the name that is above every name. And even that preposition, that is above, you can see in the text work, it's hooper. It's the same word that is the first part of has highly exalted him. It has to do with a big, a lifting up. And so it's, that is above every single name, i.e. Lord. The reason I'm saying it's Lord is because even in the context, when it gets to later, halfway through verse 11, look, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Every tongue is going to confess what the Father has bestowed on the Son, this high, exalted name. That's why we call Jesus, and at times the apostles call him the Lord Jesus Christ, Lord, Kyrios, that is, this is God pronouncing him, the Father saying, my son is Lord. It's the same thing in Psalm 2. I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. Therefore, the, the Father laughs when the enemies 
uh, try to thwart his plan. He laughs. He mocks them because I've set my king on Zion. I've bestowed on my son the name that is above every name. He is Lord. Lord of lords, king of kings. He's Lord of all. So bestowed on him that. God has highly exalted him. He's bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that. These are the things you need to pay attention to as you're studying the scripture. Go back to verse 9. Let me point out a few things that help you understand. This is how you understand what's being taught. And this is really not, this has nothing to do with reading Greek. This has to just do with reading English, which many adults still can't really do that well or try to discover what is being said, what's being argued for. Here's how you divide up texts, generally speaking. Look for the conjunctions, which is an and or a but or a for or a therefore, things like that. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and, so there's a division, and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. Then there, at the beginning of verse 10, there's another conjunction. So that he highly exalts him, bestows on him the name that is above every name to the ends of, for the purpose of. And so there's another place when you learn to read, even English, you start to see Here's how you even divide up and you help people understand each of these phrases and what's what we should learn from each of these. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Verse 11, and there's another conjunction. Every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Then Two, you have to pay attention to some prepositions as well because they have the same kind of form like the so that at the beginning of verse 10. Do you see that? So that, you can see his argument continues. He's done these things so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. And then and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. And then halfway through verse 11, two, there's a preposition you got to pay attention to because it's there's another division. Two the glory of God the Father. What that means is the ascribed glory of God the Father, His splendor, His majesty, His brightness. The reason Paul includes that at the end of verse 11, I think, is to show that there's no competition in the Godhead between glory. It's Christ is glorified and magnified and exalted and everything He does in His exalted state with every knee in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue in heaven and on earth and under the earth confessing and bending to Christ, that in no way diminishes the Father's glory, but that is all for Christ's glory, for the Spirit's glory, for the Father's glory who highly exalted Him and bestowed on Him the name. Does that make sense? Does anybody have any questions as to just the words and the general understanding. There's everyone, I want you to be able to look at that and say, yeah, I, I get what he's getting at. There's nothing that I'm like, I don't know what this phrase means or I have no idea what, because you, you need to have a good grasp of that. I, I understand what God is saying through this author and then you can get into the, now how do I divide it and teach it plainly and clearly? So you got to first have that part. Does everybody understand? Are there any questions at all? Any anything that's unclear? Just make one quick note that I don't know if it's too small to read, but I put that star out there, and that's usually like that's not that doesn't mean it's the definition of the word. If I write a star and then something, that just means this is what you should be gathering from it, or this word has to do with this. So, in heaven, it's an, it's an adjective. It's, it's not a preposition and then a noun. And so, it's an adjective which, you, in our English, you would translate it more like heavenly. Those who are heavenly, those who are earthly, those who are under earthly. Those are three adjectives in heaven, and on earth, and under the earth. In English, in heaven is a 
preposition and a noun, but in the Greek, it's an adjective. So he's saying, the heavenly shall bow their knees. Those who are in heaven is what he's getting at. The heavenly shall bend the knee and confess with the tongue. The earthly shall bend the knee and confess with the tongue. The under-earthly shall bend the knee and confess or profess with the tongue. That doesn't uh, mean people who have a heavenly life and people who are worldly. It doesn't mean that. It means people who are in heaven, people who are on earth, and people who are under the earth. Meaning, souls departed to heaven and souls sentenced to hell will be reunited with their bodies so that all who have ever existed will at the same time bend the knee and confess with the mouth that Christ is Lord. That's what he's getting at. That's what the resurrection of the body is at the end. That's why the just and the unjust are resurrected in their bodies and every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. It won't just be souls somehow confessing. It will be bent knees, confessing tongues. Some will be damned, but some will be saved. So there'll be no conversion after that, but that's what he's getting at. That every single person who has ever existed will in their physical bodies bend the knee and with their tongues acknowledge that Christ is Lord. Does that make sense? All right. I'm going to also give you the the doctrine so we don't have to work that because that's usually, you usually come up with that after you've worked through an outline typically because then you can come back and go, all right, what's a like short sentence that captures the doctrine of this passage? But the doctrine that I would suggest to you is because Christ humbled himself, himself to the lowest of lows to redeem, the Father has exalted him to reign. That's, that's what he's getting at. Therefore, because Christ humbled himself to the lowest of lows, that's the beginning of all of it, because he did that, and then the rest is the Father has highly exalted him to reign. Reign is a summary of it because the whole point is so that every knee, every tongue will confess to the glory of God the Father. Everybody good? All right, now take that or take your own Bible and then... On the back side of that paper, you're going to have 20 minutes, and it would be one, period, statement of truth, and then write the part of whatever verse out below it. So you're looking at your Bible, and you're thinking, like, where are the divisions? And it could be good to start out just with your divisions, and then you go back and see, like, how, what truth do we learn here? Do that and see what, what truths do we learn in this text. Show me the truths that are taught or inferred that we gather in this text of Scripture. And this exercise should help you learn more and more. And I hope you could do this on your own too to just practice on how do I read a passage, divide it, and be able to teach it plainly. After we do that, we'll come back and together do some cross-references from memory see what comes to mind, and then we'll work on application together. All right, 20 minutes. It is 6.44, so we're going to go till 7.04. Go. Everybody have a pen or an iPad or however you're doing it? You guys see that? Yes. Okay, how many points do we have, Jake? Six. Six points, all right. So first point is the first part of verse. We don't have the verse. you got to put the verse number and yeah. that on there so we know like what part of what verse we're dealing with. You know what I'm saying? Yep. Got to put like in parentheses out beside it or something. Philippians 2, 9, A. Right? So, therefore, God has highly exalted him. That's the part he's dealing with in the first. And it's because Christ Jesus died. Or did you change that? And, yeah, humbled himself and died. Okay. Yeah. Because Christ Jesus humbled himself and died, God the Father has.
has put him in the highest position over everything. Okay? Point two. Because Christ Jesus humbled himself and died, God has given him the highest title over everyone. And that's the second part of verse 9, right? Mm -hmm. And bestowed on him the name that is above every name. The third point is it's just the underlying portion. Okay. Yeah. Third point. Everyone will bow at the, at the feet of Jesus Christ. Okay? And that's so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. Whether they are His or not. That's for your own sake, right? Like as you're writing it to make sure you're clarifying. Mm -hmm. We're not just talking about the saints. Okay, point four. Why Why is this here? Yeah. And I drew that just because it was those two points for me I was thinking through. They're different sections of the text, but when I was thinking through the points of what is gleaned in each part, mm -hmm. they were really similar. Mm -hmm. So the only thing that's a bit different is the who has ever existed yeah. portion. So that should be in the same that should be the same point. Yeah. Those can be sub points under that point if you want to go more in particular to have those three divisions under that to say mm -hmm. and everyone in heaven will bow. Everyone on earth will bow. Everyone under the earth will bow. But that's better as a sub point on your third point. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that goes with the rest, but then it's a good thing to clarify. Like, he's giving three different groups of people that will bow. It's under the same main point that everyone will bow. You said that, everyone. And then you get to tease out, though. Look what he says by everyone. It's not just some general. He's saying, he's making it specific. Everyone in heaven, everyone on earth, everyone under the earth will bow. So that's point three. And then... What you've got is five would really be point four. So everyone will acknowledge that Jesus Christ is truly Lord. Yeah, that's good. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And then fifth point, God the Father receives all of creation's praise as Jesus name. Okay. God the Father receives all of creation's praise that is due His name to the glory of God the Father. Great. Any feedback? Anybody? Any thoughts? Is this clear? Is it true, first of all? Are his points true to what the text is saying? Yes. Is it simple and clear? Yes. Okay. Then that's a good outline. It's true. That's what the text is saying. And you've turned it into the propositional truths that we're learning in the text. And it's simple. It can be understood. That's really important. Jake, one, one thing could be that you need to shorten your points a little bit. Because they're a little bit long that they don't have to be. Your explanation of the points, an explanation of the text is going to tease all those things out. But the point itself needs to be, insofar as you're able, short to the point, as short as can be. Not adding words that you don't necessarily have to add in there for the point. Yeah, like you... When you're explaining the verse and why that's the point, like you're going to tease out all those different things kind of in there under the simple statement, short point. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah, everybody on the fourth point is probably going to be pretty long. <laughs> yeah. Everyone uh, on the fourth point, yeah. Everyone will acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. That one's pretty, sh that, one sh that one's short. 
I'm looking at my fourth point. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right, who else? Who else wants to send me a picture of your outline? I sent one up there to you, I think. Okay, let me get it. Oh, yeah, I got, I got them waiting on me. Okay. How many points is that? Is that a total of six points? Five. Five. Because three and four really should just oh, be yeah, the same okay. point. Yeah, so five. Those in heaven, on earth, and under the earth should be included in that third point. But maybe sub-points under the third point that are clarifying each of those things. But that, I think, properly should belong to the third point. Mm -hmm. Paul, why don't you just tell us what your outline <laughs> is? All right. And, like, your points and which part of the verse that has to do with. All right. I started, I have five points. I started with the zero because zero, it begins with therefore pointing back to the earlier verses, so it sort of makes sense to me. Okay. The basis of the foregoing truths is predicated on the truth in verses 6 through 8, that Jesus humbled himself in obedience to the point of death. Use the therefore. Yeah, so that's kind of like your, that would be more like an introduction or the context. Not necessarily a point in the sermon as much as it's like the context does that make sense? Right. Okay. Uh, point one then, God the Father has exalted God the Son, Jesus, to the highest possible position. And quoted, you know, God has exalted him. Very God good. Has, has, I can't read my own writing. That's good. So that's point, point one is God the Father has exalted God the Son, Jesus, to the highest possible position. Highly exalted. Yes, God is highly exalted. Yeah. Uh, point two, God the Father has given freely, joyfully, God the Son, the name above every name, Lord. Quote, bestowed on him the name that is above every name. Very good. Uh, point three, God's purpose, so that, for exalting Jesus is so that the, uh, so that at Jesus' name, every knee should bow, and then I uh, listed the three yeah, very good. He's got three subpoints of those three things under that, then he subpointed the other three. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And Great. Point four: Jesus, glor Jesus' glorification and humanity's recognition of same ultimately serve to glorify God to the glory of God the Father. Excellent. What you've got in your. Uh, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, I would make that should be your fourth point. Not like a sub-point under the other one. Because it's two different things. I would make that your fourth point and then your fifth point, what you've got there at the end. I would divide it like that and really tease out that it's every knee shall bow. So everyone's going to bow. And that's a point. And you're gonna you have those sub-points explaining like heaven, earth, under the earth. And then fourth point, Every single tongue will confess and really highlight that, that every knee is going to bow and then every tongue is going to confess. And th you can conflate them, but I think when you're teaching through, like sep Paul's saying two separate things and he separates those by a conjunction and, and so separate them even in your outline to highlight every knee is going to bow. And the next point, every single tongue is going to confess. Because one is this willfully bowing down and like homage, and then the other is they're going to vocally, not only like a king comes up with a sword threatening and so they bow down before him, but they're going to vocally and willingly say, Jesus Christ is Lord. And they have to vocally say that. So I think separating those two out would be good and helpful. But that's excellent. My computer is not loading those, but... Excellent. From what you guys heard of that, were those points, were they true? Yes. Were they clear and simple? Paul, one thing with those is you need to work a little bit on simplifying, like not putting too many things in parentheses or whatever in your main point. Like that comes when you're explaining all of it. But the point itself should be as short as you can make it, just clear and simple. This is the truth we should be gleaning from it. 
So in, in the point that you're writing, you're not explaining. You're just asserting. This is the truth. Simple, plain truth. And then you're going to, basically, when you give a point in a sermon, then you're going to explain why you said that in such a simple way. And you're going to argue for the fact that that simple truth you said, that's what the text is getting at. And then you go into the explanation and all that kind of stuff. Does that make sense? So it's like, this is the point. The text says this. Let me. Sh what we're saying is, let me show you why that's the point. And then by the end of your explaining what he's saying, then they're going to go, that is the point. Does that make sense? So simple, plain, short, not too teased out. The teasing out stuff comes with your explaining the text. But the point is simple, short, clear. But that's great. That's the hardest part is you have to get it right. But then after you get it right, the hardest part is being simple and plain and not like a long sentence that... And Because you remember when you're teaching, people are, are listening. They're not writing... I mean, they're not reading it. And so a longer point is sometimes really hard to follow because we're just listening to it. So it's got to be... If, if you can, it's got to be short to the point and then you're going to explain it all. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. That was excellent, though. All right, we've got... Dylan, I think this is yours. That you've got like a one and then a half moon to the next bit, right? Then a two and a half. Okay, that's yours. Okay. So tell us tell us what your, what your points are. Point one. Because Christ humbled himself, taking human form to die on the cross for our redemption... The Father has now exalted him higher than anything, higher than everything. Okay, and what, what's that? That's from the Four first part of verse 19? To 9. Or 9, sorry, yeah. So that's the, therefore God has highly exalted him. Yes. Right? Okay. Uh, point 2, Philippians 2, 9b. Because Christ humbled himself, taking human form, to die on the cross for our redemption, the Father has gladly bestowed on him the name that means Lord of all. Very good. Point 3, Philippians 2.10. The Father has exalted Christ and named him Lord of all, so that all people shall bow the knee to him, including those who have passed on. Mm-hmm. Well, here we go. Point 4. Keep going. Philippians 2.11a. The Father has exalted Christ and named him Lord of all, so that all these people not only bow the knee, but also acknowledge willingly or unwillingly that Christ is Lord of all. Point five, Philippians 2, 11b, all of these things, the humbling, the exaltation, the declaration of Christ as Lord over all, and the final submission of all people to Christ's Lordship is for the ultimate glory of God the Father. Excellent. Are these things true? Yes. Are they simple, short, plain, and clear? No. But every one of these, I'm, I'm reading this, and so the way that I would do my notes, and I'm going to show you my outline. All of these is like what I would put, so I've got all caps, my point, the text of Scripture below it, and then usually right below that is in just black text, a little bit longer of an explanation of why that's my point. And all of those are what would be that explanation. Like it's a good, you know, it's a couple of sentences or it's a long sentence really teasing out why that is the point. But the point needs to be short and simple. And so you get rid of any words that you don't need to put in there to drive home that main point. And then you're going to explain why that point is there. So all of those are true, but you need to be able to take all of those and turn them into a short statement of plain, simple truth. And then all those things you would put down like below it to kind of tease out why that was your point. Or what is meant by the Father exalted Christ for this. Then you're going to explain like, what do you mean by that? Does that make sense? Yeah. So all those are 
That's it. That's the truth. The hard part when you're writing an outline and uh, teaching people the simple truths you're gathering is bringing it up into a short statement of truth. Remembering that they're listening to it, not reading it. Alright, so tell me what's point one. Because Christ humbled himself, God the Father has highly exalted the Son. Yeah, it's him. Yes. Him is how that sentence would go. Because Christ humbled himself, God the Father has yes. highly exalted him. Yes. You don't need the Son because you've already got Christ in the I sentence. Understand. Like the antecedent is Christ already. Great. Therefore, God has highly exalted Him. That's right. Okay, then two should have the word because you're saying so. Because God the Father has bestowed on the Son the Lord of everything. No, it can't because be because. Christ humbled because Christ humbled Himself. Oh, because Christ humbled Himself. God, God the Father has bestowed on the Son the Lord of everything. Okay, that's not a sentence, but that's close. Bestowed on the Son, the Lord of everything? Yes. Bestowed um, the, name. the name over everything? I mean, that's not a sentence. You didn't bestow on Him the Lord of everything. That, well, that would mean the Father oh, took a Lord so and put this, it on Christ. If I take the out of there, would that still work? Bestowed on the Son, Lord of everything? No, because that's saying He put on Christ, Lord of everything. Like, He took a Lord and put it on Christ. That's what oh. that sentence would be meaning. You see what I'm saying? Yes. Yeah. So it was worded not in a good way. Yeah, I, I get what you're getting at. You're, you're getting State at it. Of Lord of everything. Yeah. Lord, yeah. Which is over everything. Okay. You could just say, God the Father has named the Son Lord of everything. Named the Son Lord of everything. I have that because Christ, I was going to put because Christ, because Christ humbled himself, mm -hmm. God the Father has bestowed on him the name of everything. The name of everything? I don't know. No. No, it'd be. You can't say Lord, so I was trying to make something else up. Yeah. That's when you start over that sentence. Okay. Yeah. But the truth, uh, we can all see what you're getting at. It just. Didn't do it well. Well, that sentence. It, it. Yeah, you just have to tweak because it a little bit. Because Christ humbled himself, God the Father has named him Lord over him. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now, point three. Because Christ humbled himself, at his name every knee will bow. Yeah. Alright, so here, here's the, the thing that you got to pay attention when you're reading. In the text, the so that is no longer talking about his humiliation. The so that is talking about his exaltation. There's a transition from the so that. See, he's saying, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. That's the truth that the so that comes for. The so that is not pointing back to verses 6 through 8. The so that there is pointing to the verse right before it. And so the point is, so you could, your points would all make sense. Because the Father has exalted Christ. Okay. It's no longer, the so that's not connected to the humiliation. The so that there is connected to the exaltation that he just laid out. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So, because the Father has exalted Christ, let's say, let's change it to that. Right? Does that make sense? Yes. The you're still getting at the truths, you're just not, the therefores or the so that is coming from a different place. But, be... Because the Father has exalted Christ, uh, every knee will bow from everyone who is in heaven, everyone is on earth, everyone is under the earth. So, or that's, the, that's point four, sorry. Yeah, so point three is at His name every knee will or shall bow. Yeah, that's good. You should get the first part right. That he's talking about the exaltation there. So because the Father has exalted Christ, at His name every knee will bow. Yep. And then, 
sub points under that point. Not a whole, probably not a whole new point because you just said that. Mm -hmm. You said every knee shall bow. You don't need another point that says every knee shall bow in all these places. You need to explain what he means by all knees shall bow. And then that's what he explains. Like what Paul is saying when he says every knee shall bow, then he explains what he means by every knee. Lest we just go, yeah, like everybody who's alive at the second coming, he's saying, nope. In heaven and on earth and under the earth. And so that's all that is, is an explanation of the truth that he laid out. And so in that sense, you would just put those, you could put three subpoints under it to clarify by every knee, look what he says. Every knee in heaven, every knee on earth, every knee under the earth. We'll put sub point, put point four underneath three. Sure, yeah. Because that would make... But make it'd be sense. better to have three sub points because he gives three clarifications of the truth. The truth is every knee will bow. Yeah. And then it's three clarifications. By every knee I mean on earth, I mean under the earth, I mean in heaven. Everyone who is in heaven. Yeah, Ryan, what do you have? Do you have somewhere in that to talk about this is going to happen at the second coming yeah I think that that should be in the explanation of that point that's like what he's talking about is in the end this is the resurrection of the just and the unjust the the unjust the unrighteous the wicked they're going to be resurrected in their bodies and be brought before Christ to be judged. And they will, part of the reason they're going to be resurrected in their bodies is so with bodies they will bend the knee. With actual tongues, they will confess Christ as Lord. Before then, they're sentenced to hell to suffer in the soul and the body forever. But I think that's what Paul is even getting at. It's like, even those who don't have bodies right now because their soul is in hell, and then those whose souls in heaven, the resurrection is going to happen, and they will bend the knee. They will confess with their mouth. But it, yes, I think that would be very important to just not leave it, people going like, when? But, but not as part of the outward. That would be probably not. It's more like the explanation of... It's like, and what Paul's, um, what Paul's getting at is he's, he's talking about in the end, at the great white throne judgment, this is what's going to happen. Yeah, I think that would be a very good thing to clarify, but not, not to be a main point. All right, then let's keep going, Dusty. So where are we at? Point five? Uh, yes. Which I would say should be point four. Yes. Because Christ humbled himself, every knee will confess Christ is Lord. Yeah, everyone will confess Christ is Lord, right? Yeah. Oh, my bad. Yep. Yep. And then uh, on six, because Christ humbled himself, everything will be to the glory of God the Father. Yeah. And remember, it's the exaltation that we're in the, the results of the exaltation now. So, yeah, something like that. But very good. This is something to learn too, guys, is when you're writing an outline on something like this, what you were seeking to do is very good, that all of your points are getting at the same thing. And all of your points even start out with the same words. That's good. You just have to pay attention for when in the text. Actually, that's not what he's saying. He's saying, so like your first two points, I think, should start with because Christ humbled himself and then points uh, three four and five should start with something like because the father has exalted the son and they all start the same way because that's what he's he's getting at that helps the listener understand clearly we're talking about they understand what we're talking about you're reminding them even in your point what the context is so if your point is just every knee will bow to Christ that's not as helpful as because the Father has exalted the Son, every knee will bow to Christ. You're reminding them in your point what the context of everything that we're dealing with is. So that was an excellent job doing that. That's a clear... You can work that into your points to where you're reminded of where we're at. It's not just vague like truths being thrown around. There's an argument that he's laying out. So, excellent job. Basically, chapter, verse 10 is where it should switch over to the exaltation all the way to the, to the end of 11. Right. He's talking about exaltation in the 
9 is talking about the yeah. Humility right. And then the the last part of verse 11, I wouldn't put yeah. uh, because the Father has exalted Christ, because then it's he's dealing with the result of what everyone's going to do because Christ has been exalted. He's finishing it out with, and all of this will be to the glory of God the Father. So you don't need a because in there because it's the conclusion. This is all to the glory of God the Father. So your, your last point. I don't think necessarily should start with that uh, because this, it should, that's the, that's this is, shouldn't be in there at all. Yeah. On that last one. Yeah. We just, I'll show you what mine is and ex explain that here in a second. All right. Anybody else want to, or you want to move on? All right. Over, over <clears throat> Did you send me one? No, I didn't. Send okay. One. You oversimplified? Well, that's I hard. Right. That's hard to do in an outline. So tell, because yeah, tell me what your points are. Well, I had my first point was just Christ is exalted, but then I actually wrote out points similar to how they did the outline. Yeah. So the first one was because Christ humbled himself; he has been exalted. That's not a bad point. No. That's simple, plain, and in your explanation of the point, you're going to go, "Look, it's God the Father has highly exalted Christ." Mm -hmm. You can say, because Christ humbled himself, he's now been exalted. That's not a bad so I point. Have, I have like shorthand of the point, and then like yeah. I wrote out longer, because I wasn't sure. But that's good, especially in family worship. Like, thinking through that, simpler the better. You that's want probably. Harlow to be able to understand your point. Yeah. And you can say, because Christ got really low to save us from our sins, now he's been exalted high. Mm -hmm. Simpler the better. And you can explain. Blame all of the stuff under the point. Yeah. But simple is good. Okay. You want me to continue? Yep. Anything? Keep going. Point two at Christ is above every name. And then my long point was because Christ became the lowest, he was given the name above all names. Yeah. Point three was Christ is reigning. And similar to Dusty, I still stayed on the trend of uh, him being humble. But when you were um, talking about how was about the exaltation, Mm -hmm. Being exalted, I kind of tag on this last part of it. So, Christ is reigning because Christ submitted unto death and was exalted. He is now reigning over living and dead. Or he's now reigning over the living and dead. Okay. And still. Yeah. And what part of the verse is that from? Uh, verse 10. Okay. That's just all. I'd say it's more. It's more getting at the. That's not quite as clear on what he's saying. I would say. Yeah, at first I. That is a truth. Yeah. But that's not the specific truth he's getting at. That's more like that's behind the truth. Mm -hmm. That's something you could even explain yeah. under the point of like Christ is ruling and reigning now, mm -hmm. and but there are some people who still oppose his reign, and but one day, <laughs> every tongue, every knee. Then for point four, I put uh, Christ as Lord, because Christ emptied himself as a servant. Uh, he is now Lord over all. That was for verse 11. A, verse 11a. That's good. And then for verse 11b, the Father has exalted Christ for his glory. Yeah. Maybe a little bit too simple in some of them, but simple's good. Yeah. And laboring to be simple is really good. All right. Bringo. All right, so context, doctrine. I told you the doctrine. I've got five doctrinal truths in the text, then five uses, but we'll, we'll do the uses just as an exercise. So point one, because Christ stooped low to redeem, the Father has highly exalted him to reign. That's my point one, because we're talking about the exaltation of Christ or him reigning, ruling and reigning. And then under that, and I didn't ask you guys to do that, but just by the way, like under that is a great time to then 
because we're talking about the exaltation of Christ, then use the catechism and explain what does it mean that God has highly exalted Him? And then you can tease out all those things. Christ's exaltation consists in His rising again from the dead. So the exaltation of Christ by the Father is first raising Him from the dead. And then you just go on through that and His ascension up into heaven and His sitting at the right hand of God the Father. His session at the right hand of God the Father. And it, His exaltation has to do with Him coming again on the last day to judge the world. And so that's a good part. Bring in the catechism, especially when you're dealing with a doctrine, a, a cardinal doctrine like the exaltation of Christ. We've got a catechism question that explains that. If you're dealing with justification or sanctification, progressive sanctification, kingly office, priestly office, any of those things, we have 118 questions in our catechism that gives a really simple, and if you're thinking like, how do I help people understand what the exaltation of Christ consists of? It's like, pull that in and then just look at all the points that are taught in this answer to question 32 and you can even make those subpoints. You don't even have to just like talk about the catechism, just say, well, our, our catechism points out that the exaltation of Christ first consists in His being resurrected from the dead. So Christ died, His body is buried, and then the Father raises Him from the dead. Then He sends, then He sits at the right hand, ruling and reigning until all of His enemies be made a footstool for His feet. That's his exaltation. And part of his exaltation is that all judgment has been handed over to the Son and he's going to come back and judge the world on the last day. So that, that's a good opportunity to do that kind of stuff. Uh, point two. Because Christ stooped low to redeem, the Father has bestowed on him the name Lord. There's how you could phrase that, yeah. <laughs> Dusty. Uh, the Father has bestowed on him the name Lord. And then I just jotted down these couple of things as I'm writing that. This is the God has made him both Lord and Christ from Peter's sermon. Just so I would remember it later. Uh, point three. Because Christ is exalted as Lord over all, every single knee will bow to him as Lord. I add single in there to just try to emphasize that it's not... I mean, Paul's getting at every single knee. And the reason I, I phrased it like that, every single knee, is because of his clarification of what he means by every knee. He goes into, I mean every single knee in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. And so then I would have subpoints under that explaining that in heaven and on earth and under the earth. But you can see how I put into point three... In the way that I phrased it, the clarification that Paul makes of heaven and earth under the earth, he's meaning every knee. Every, every. Fourth, because Christ is exalted as Lord over all, every single tongue will confess that He is Lord. Every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That every, we have to interpret the every based on what He said in verse 10, because he has just said, so that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Then he clarifies what he means by every. And so then we should take that with us into verse 11. And so he doesn't have to repeat himself. Every, and I mean every tongue on heaven and on earth and under the earth. He doesn't have to say that again. He just clarified, I mean every single. And so every single tongue will confess that he is Lord. Then point five. Every knee bowing and tongue confessing will serve to glorify God the Father who exalted His Son as Savior and Lord. That's borderline too long. I wasn't going to say anything. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm trying, that's the conclusion. So usually if a last the last part of the verse is a conclusion, or your last point is kind of the conclusion. I'm trying to write the point in a way that brings back everything that we've just said to emphasize. Every knee bowing and tongue confessing will serve to glorify God the Father, who exalted His Son as Savior and Lord. That is like all five points put into one, but it's borderline being too long. 
and then the uses that we're going to work on instruction, warning, examination, comfort, and exhortation or direction. Anybody have any questions about this, this outline? Okay, let's go to cross-references. This is, this is a good exercise to do as well, so you can think through, like, how well do I know the Bible? Actually, I'm going to have to pull that back up. John 12 jumped out at me when I was reading it. John what? John 12. When the Greeks ask to speak with Jesus, and Jesus talks about the seed that needs to die and before it can bear. Right. Okay, so cross references are going to help shine light on the points or the parts of the parts of the scripture and so you have to be careful with cross references because sometimes you you can bring one in and people are going like it kind of sounds like you just want to talk about that verse that didn't really shine light on on this these verses and you can't let the cross reference be the focal point either right Cross -reference and just the cross -reference. That's right. So cross-reference is a little flash of light that shines light on the actual text you're dealing with. It should be like a... And it helps you go, whoa, I understand this text a lot better by using the analogy of Scripture, all of Scripture, and this shines light on it. Like Stephen Lawson says, the girl you bring to the dance is the girl you dance with. Like, don't dance with some other girl. You brought this girl to the dance. You better dance with Philippians 2, 9 through 11. So whatever scripture reference you have that you want to implement into there it should not have to be exposited on or explained or anything like that. It should, in itself, have enough explanation to like the, what you're trying to say. No. If you ever quote a text and you don't explain it, you're failing. You don't just like quote a text. You have to explain it of why you're bringing that text in. But you're not going to do with it what we're doing to this text. But you can't just like bring in a text and just go, that's self-evident. Because everyone out there is going, what? <laughs> but you have to act like, like this is not going to make sense unless I explain it and emphasize the part of a verse that I'm the why I'm saying this is helpful in understanding this. Every text that you quote must be explained and emphasized. The best at this is, and I don't agree with how much he uses like big, huge, long cross references, but John MacArthur mm -hmm. is the best at when he uses a short cross reference. And this is just stylistically. Like MacArthur will be in a text and then take you to 50 different places and like read 30 verses in one other place and say, no, dance with this text. But when he cross references a text, you pay attention, listen to him preach, you understand what that text meant. He doesn't ever just kind of read it and you're like, so how did that help us? You're never doing that. He is excellent at, he'll read it, then he'll like paraphrase it or he'll re-emphasize part of the verse, but he doesn't go to cross, he goes to big cross references, but it's never in the sense of like, I don't know why you went there. It's like, whoa, that, that helped me. He's very good at, and you have to be really good at cross-referencing and emphasizing why you're cross-referencing because you remember everyone listening to you preach should have their Bible open and they're looking at the text you're preaching. But when you cross-reference, they, they can't flip over there. They're not even reading it. So they're having to like listen. They don't get to read it with you. And so it better be very clear and you're emphasizing the truth in that verse or verses that that helps shine light on this text. Does that make sense? best method to do is if you have a scripture reference, say the scripture, say this is why I used it, and give it an explanation of that scripture on how it's pertaining to the text you're preaching, and then move on. Sure. Or you can just say, you know, God is, 
God has highly exalted him. Like after you explain that, and he's saying this is God the Father has super exalted, hyper exalted the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a word that means he set him as high in rank and power and authority that anyone, anything can be set. You know, it's the same same type thing that David writes in Psalm 110 where the Father says to the Son, after the ascension of Christ, sit at my right hand. That's the exaltation of Christ. And so that is even, that's a way to do a cross-reference to where it just goes, oh yeah, there's other places in Scripture that talk about the exaltation of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Father's saying, sit on the throne. Sit at my right hand. So, does that make sense? All right, so what are, I just gave you one for Philippians 2, 9a, that first point. What's something else that comes to mind that would be a good cross-reference to bolster up or shine light on the Father has highly exalted Christ? Psalm 2, 6. Okay. As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. The Father has set the Son on the throne. Psalm 110. Psalm 110, yep. What else? Psalm 24. He can go in. The gates open up for him. His hands are clean. His heart is pure. And unto vanity, he has not lifted up his soul nor sworn deceitfully. We should sing that in a minute. Okay. What about uh, point two? And bestowed on him the name that is above every name. The fact that, remember, we're we're trying to cross-reference something that shines light on. Because Christ stooped low to redeem, the Father has bestowed on him the name Lord. What's a cross-reference? Ephesians 1.21. Okay. I guess you could start at 20. That he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand. That's exaltation. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess that would go with the first, that first it could, one. Yeah, it could go with both. And then 21. Far above all rule and authority and power, and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. I mean, like Bingo. Yeah. yeah. That's a very good cross reference text just for this whole thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you could use the first part of that to go with point one. Mm-hmm. And then you could say, and further, when you get to point two. Yeah. It's like in in Ephesians 1, he not only talks about the exaltation of Christ like Paul does here in Philippians 2, but he also talks about the name. He has a better name than anyone. Yeah, that's great. What else on uh, on point 2? What's another cross-reference that just comes to your mind that helps shine light on the Father has bestowed on Him the name Lord? Acts 2. <laughs> There's one right here. That's a good cross reference. So Peter says, The fathers raised him from the dead and made him both Lord and Christ, whom you crucified. He made him, declared him Lord. Anything else for point two? Uh, John 10 17, Isaiah 52 13. No, 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 no. By memory. Oh, and quote the verse to me. I can't. Okay. That's what I'm going for. That's why that's why we read the Bible a lot. Part of it is that. Because you better understand the other parts of the Bible when you are really familiar with the Bible. Because it comes to your mind like Peter's Sermon on Pentecost. Or Psalm 110, like you said earlier, Paul. Or Psalm 2.6. Or Ephesians 1. That came to your mind because you've read Ephesians and it's like, it just triggers. When you see that truth, you go, I've seen that truth, or I've seen something that helps us understand this truth. Yeah. We just went through Hebrews 1, 2. Yeah. And it ends, uh, see, He's the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of His nature, and He upholds the universe by the power of His word. After making purification for sin, He sat down at the right hand in the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name He has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Mm. Bingo. 
And with a cross reference like that, you would just say something like, in my opinion, I think you should say something like, in Hebrews 1, is that 3 or 4? That's 1, let's see. That's 4. But the, the last part, it's like the apostle to the Hebrews says, he has inherited a name that is far superior far superior to the angelic beings. Yeah. It's like, but you're just shining light. That's like, this is talked about another. And it helps you understand too, what does it mean he's bestowed on him the name that is above every name? It's like, well, the apostle of the Hebrew says he's inherited. It means because, and the verse right before that has to do with his humiliation. After making purification for sins, humiliation, he's exalted. He sat down at the right hand of the Father, and he inherits a name far superior. It's the same thing here. You can go read commentaries from guys, and they are so scared to say the therefore is built off of the humiliation because of an error in their day, a heresy that was saying the only reason Christ is exalted is because he had to merit it in and of himself for the Father then to treat him as exalted. It's like, no, 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 that's, that's not what Paul's getting at. But they were scared to say that therefore had to do with his humiliation leading to his exaltation because they were scared of that heresy where people were trying to act like Christ wasn't already infinitely glorious before his incarnation. And so they like shy away and they say it's, it doesn't have to do with that. But it does. It's what the text says. It's the context. Because Paul's whole point is, you men, humble yourselves and serve other people. And he says, just like Christ did. And then at the end, 9 to 11, what's behind that is, look how the Father has exalted the Son after His humiliation. You, you will also be exalted. You'll be glorified. So put yourself low now. Right now is low time. Later is glorified, exalted time reigning with Christ in heaven. But you can read some of that and go, I don't know, it really seems like he's saying therefore, and he's building off of that because this is the rewards of his suffering. But, all right, so let's go on to point three. What are some cross references that come to your mind for point three? John 18, 5 and 6. What is that? It's where Jesus is being arrested. But um, so, uh, they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Yeah. I don't know if that's not for or not. Right? Yeah, it could be just the power of, right. yeah. And the Greek is yeah. I am. It's not I am he. Right. He just... They say, we're seeking Jesus of Nazareth. And he says, I am. And they fall. Woo! That's crazy. That'll preach. All right. What, what else? Brandon, what's something that comes to mind? Anything come to mind for point three? So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Um, I mean, dealing with the first part or like getting into the sub points? Uh, either. I mean, just with... Breaking out the sub points, I think each of those can really be this good clarifying things that show the significance. It's like for those in heaven, mm. uh, you have a passage, I think it's Paul in First Timothy, uh, that he will receive the crown of righteousness and all who longed for his appearing. Mm -hmm. Just the, those who long for his appearing and died without seeing it will bend their knee at his appearing. Mm. Good. We're missing a really obvious one for this. Matthew. Anybody have a New American Standard Bible? King James? It'll be all caps. That part of the verse will be all caps because he's quoting Isaiah. To where Yahweh says, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue confess. Every tongue will swear to me, is how it's phrased in our translation. But the reason the NASB and the King James puts that in all caps is because that's how they uh, treat an Old Testament quotation in the New Testament. But he's literally, this is what's crazy, even about this exaltation of Christ, that... 
naming him Lord brings with it the, I mean, the, the Greek translation of Yahweh is Lord. And he's saying, Christ is Yahweh. Christ is Jehovah. It's not just like he's a lesser than Jehovah and the Father is Yahweh, the one true living God. He's saying, no, Christ is Yahweh. Because he's even quoting from Isaiah where Yahweh is saying, everyone will bow to me and swear to me. Meaning the same thing as every tongue will confess. So what is that? Somebody have that? That's Isaiah 55? Hmm? 45. What do you got, Jake? Read it. Isaiah 45, 23? Yep. By myself I have sworn, from my mouth has gone out in righteousness, a word that shall not return. To me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear allegiance. Woo! And Paul's quoting that, saying, that's Jesus. Jesus. All right, what about four? I mean, let's move, I guess maybe not from four, because that is included there. What about five? Every knee bowing and tongue confessing will serve to glorify God the Father, who exalted His Son as Savior and Lord. Why is it a bad thing to look on the references here? Because but... the exercise is for you and for you to see, do you know the Bible? Okay. Do you read the Bible enough to just like, it's in you. Have you hidden the word in your heart so that you may not sin against them, but so that also you can better be a better student of other passages because you read this and you're thinking of something else. Does that make sense? That's what this exercise is for. Not to write a sermon, but to show, I want you to see how badly you need to be devouring the Scriptures. If you want to teach your family the Bible well, you need to be reading the Scriptures a lot, fellowshipping with the Lord in private worship. Matthew 7. Just quote the verse. It is written. Not all... uh... Who say to me, Lord, Lord, will inherit the kingdom of God? Nah. I wouldn't use that as a cross-reference. We're dealing... This is soli deo gloria. Yeah. We're dealing with soli deo gloria at the end here. All of this is to the glory of God the Father. I still want to say Ephesians 1. That's Ephesians. Yeah, I know. First Timothy 1 Timothy 1.17. What's that? Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible... The only wise God be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Bingo. That's a good cross-reference. Go to those doxological statements that have to do with to the glory of God the Father. Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. That Him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to Him be glory in the church, through the church, and in Christ Jesus. There's a direct cross-reference to that. What Christ is doing glorifies the Father. To Him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. But that, that point is a good one to bring a few short, just, just like rapid fire, some doxological statements that is just, this all exists for the glory of God. Bring in Isaiah where he says, the people that I've called by my name that I've created for my glory. Just really hammer that, that everything exists for the glory of God. We have to, I think we have to learn to hammer, like really beat the drum hard on points that are sort of just ignored in our evangelical world at large. And, and that everything exists for the glory of God. Everything that's happening is for the glory of God. Christ's humiliation and exaltation is for the salvation of His people, but primarily it's for the glory of God. Just hammering that, because you men know, that's so avoided. But that's why we exist. That's why all this is happening. To the glory of God the Father. He doesn't end with to the good of God's people. 
But we would look at all that and go, well, that's definitely, that's a true thing. It is for our good who are united to Christ. But he ends with the pinnacle of why everything exists. This is all to the glory of God the Father. So hammer that. Hammer those kind of things. And learn the things that are just kind of avoided and that need to be hammered even harder because it seems that we as a people are so prone to forget them or sideline them. Does that make sense? All right, somebody give me, let's not do instruction because that we'll do that maybe last. But give me a, in these truths that we learn, give me a, how to use these truths, any of them or kind of all of it put together for warning. Bow the knee now in humble submission to your Lord, or you will bow under his foot as an enemy. Yeah. All right, so the way you phrased that was a direction. <clears throat> Phrase it in a warning. Gotcha. If you don't, there you go. There you go. Yeah. That's a warning. The bend the knee now is an exhortation, but it brought with it a warning, because if you don't, but. Just do the warning. Like you, you need to see from this text of Scripture that if you will not willingly bend the knee to Christ now and confess Him as Lord now, trust in Him, turn from your sin, you will do it later, but it will be to your damnation. That's an indicative truth. That's, that's a way to warn. It's like, look, you cannot be exempt from this. No one will be exempt from bending the knee to Christ and confessing Him as Lord. But for some, maybe even you, friend, it'll be too late. You'll do it to your damnation. But you won't steal any glory from Him. He'll be glorified in redeeming you or damning you, but you will bend the knee. That's, that's warning. Okay, what about examination? So, examination can be both ways. It can be trying to get someone who's still unconverted to really examine their state. But I think most often I'm trying to use the warning to, to do that. That kind of makes them examine and they're warned. And I'm trying to use examination for the edification of believers. For us to examine ourselves and be like, where do I need to confess and repent and you start test myself? Asking them, do you? Do you bend the knee to Christ? Do you yeah. Do that now? Yeah. Or you could say, are you living as though Christ is Lord? That's a good am- examination. Yeah. Uh, Both of those are good. But the one is, if someone from the outside looked at your life, would they say, he believes this, that Jesus Christ has been highly exalted, that you believe that and you submit to him now? Or does it seem like Christ... Uh, I kind of acknowledge that he's exalted, not super exalted. You say uh, you say you bend the knee to Christ, but what keeps it? What sin keeps it from touching the ground? Hmm. You say you bend yeah. the knee to Christ, but what keeps it from touching all the way to the ground? Yeah. Are you posturing right. <laughs> like you bend the knee to Christ, but you're really holding you're holding back? Mm-hmm. That's good. That was really good. Look, look at the, the result of all of this. This is to the glory of God. Do you love the glory of God? Do you look at this text and that a fact that it ends with to the glory of God the Father and that just makes you go, yeah! Or does that make you go, huh? Like, where are you at? If, that, if that's your response to the majestic splendor of the triune God... What's going on in your life? Why is your heart so cold? If you're not pumped up about the glory of God, that's another kind of examination that you can go, I don't know, why am I so cold? Or, and then you could even, you can really start meddling. It's like, are you, making, are you making peace with sin that you know about, but you're just making peace with it? It's like, yeah, your heart will probably be cold to the glory of God because you're in your function, you're more committed to your glory. Things like that. All right, how, how do you use this for comfort? 
if you're if you're already bowing the knee, then you're a joint heir with Christ, and you'll profit by your own glorification. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. If you suffer humiliation now, you'll be exalted later. Great. Very good. Especially, and then you go further into that, like, you who are suffering now. Maybe not persecution or, like, humiliation in the sense, in, in some other sense, but you who are suffering now. Look at the sufferings of Christ. Look what He's done for you, believer. And look how those who sow in tears will reap with shouts of joy. Like those kind of things. Think of sick people, suffering people. Think of, think of Christians who are laboring, they're trying to grow in grace, and they have blown it. And they've got sin that they need to confess, and they know it, and they're under conviction, and they're repenting of it, but they, they need to be... They need to have their face lifted up and say, Christ is not going to abandon you. Keep going. Like, think of all those kind of different cases. Anybody else have a comfort? You are able to willingly at that time bow the knee mm. and declare Him your Lord. Yeah. It's a joyful time for you. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good comfort. Like, look, look around at all, all the people in the world who it seems like they hate Christ. And they hate you because you love Christ. One day, you will joyfully declare Him Lord, joyfully bend the knee, and everyone else will too. You're on the winning side. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's that, like, hey, we win. We're going to win. This, that's, that's a comforting thing. All right, what about exhortation or direction? Exhortation is more like you should. Direction is just saying, do this. I guess you could remind them that Christ is reigning now. So, you know, do, do what you can uh, and just spread the gospel. Just spread the gospel in that way. Yeah. It looks like he's reigning. Yeah. Is, because Christ is reigning now, yeah. act like it in your preaching of the gospel. Kiss the sun now. Yeah. Go tell people. that An exhortation, yeah, that could be too. Exhortation could be that you're trying to get sinners to repent and believe on Christ. That's right. And then with preaching the gospel, look, Christ has been highly exalted. What are you afraid of? Go and preach Him. <clears throat> What else? What else for exhortation direction? This is where the rubber meets the road. You want to use these truths so Christians can go like, okay, but what do I do? What do I do with this? I don't want to be a hearer of the word only. I want to be a doer. So what is implied in this that I should be doing? Because Christ is reigning over everything, uh, you should not have any fear and have the courage to go out and do what you should be doing. Yeah, that's more like comfort that kind of gets in the... Only the end of the sentence is an exhortation. But with exhortations and directions, they should be really specific. Because it's... I try to get comfort yeah. in there at the same time. Yeah, but separate those. Like, you want to comfort, but then you want to give clear direction. Like, Because so, if you told me that, I should go like, okay, that's already what I'm doing. I'm in my mind trying to do what I should be doing, but something more specific. Brandon, Brandon, what's an exhortation that we should glean from these truths? Uh, humble yourself, therefore. Yeah. Look at Christ. Stooped low. Humble yourself. You want to be great? Serve. You need to go and serve other people. The King of the universe served. You need to serve. And then get explicit on that. Like, what does that look like? I'd say, uh, every time confessing that Christ is Lord, glorifies God the, the Father, then go and proclaim that Christ is Lord mm. for the glory of God the Father. Yeah. He's Lord. Talk like it. Act like it. Go proclaim that to people. Be concerned with what glorifies God the Father. That's yeah, good. Go and proclaim it. Mm-hmm. Could you break it up to different like people, husbands and fathers? Oh yeah. Exalt Christ in your home. Yeah. 
Look how exalted Christ actually is. Men who are leading your families. Teach that. Teach, teach how awesome and how highly exalted Christ is. And act like it in your home too. Act like Christ is highly exalted because He is. Don't act contrary to this in your home and preach this Christ. Don't preach a weak, begging, wimpy Christ. Preach the one true Christ who is exalted. God's bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so don't take it out of education. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's good. Make sure your child you're educating your children that everything is saturated with the name that is above every name. Christ is Lord over the education. Excellent. One of the things for earlier for uh, warning is if you will not humble yourself now, God will never exalt you later. You won't humble yourself now, you will not be exalted later. The cross comes before the crown. The meek, another the exhortation of looking at Christ's humiliation leading to His exaltation. It's the same thing He says in the Beatitudes. The meek shall inherit the earth. It's not the arrogant. It's not the proud. It's not the tall. It's not the strong. The meek shall inherit the earth. So that's more like a use for instruction. Some of these things are things you want to put in there first for instruction, like clarifying. What are some inferences, some truths inferred or from dealing with this from other places in Scripture that you want to make clear. The humble shall reign with Christ. Any other thoughts on application? This is the th- these five things are, are good things for you to just put in a note in your phone and when you go to family worship, like, Think through that. How to take a few of these to to make uses of whatever the truth is. Make uses. That's how you can apply it to your wife. Level it up for your wife. Like, look at your wife and talk to her, you who have younger kids. Like, don't always talk to where it's only, like, the kids can understand everything. Like, shift gears sometimes and just talk directly to your wife that will help her and you can you can go a little bit deeper with her, especially with application, because she's going to be able to like make connections that kids can't always make all the connections you're trying to make in their mind, but your wife can. So don't neglect that too. All right. Any other thoughts or questions for for this? Very helpful. Cool. Great. All right, Jake. Why don't you come lead us and let's sing Psalm 24. Who is the man that shall ascend into the hill of God? Or who within his holy place shall have a firm abode? Whose hands are clean, whose heart is pure, and unto vanity, who have not lifted up his soul, nor sworn deceitfully, nor sworn deceitfully. He from the eternal shall receive the blessing him upon. And righteousness is from the God of His salvation. This is the generation that after Him inquire. O Jacob, who do seek thy face with their whole heart's desire. With their whole heart's desire. Ye gates, lift up your heads on high, ye doors that last for a. Be lifted up that so the King of glory enter may. 
But who of glory is the King, the mighty Lord is this. In that same Lord, that great in might and strong in battle is, and strong in battle is. Ye gates, lift up your heads, ye doors, doors that do last for a be lifted up that so the King of glory enter may. But who is he that is the King of glory? Who is this? The Lord of hosts and none but he, the King of glory is. The King of glory is. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for seating King Jesus on high and giving him, bestowing him the name above all names. Thank you that you have put your enemies under your feet and making them your friends. In Christ's name, amen. 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 Until next week, man.